the Ford Foundation International Professor of Economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a co-director of the Abu Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab. His latest book is Good Economics for Hard Times, co-authored with Esther Dufflo. And Srinivasan Jain is the managing editor of NDTV. He currently anchors the award-winning ground reportage and investigative show called Truth vs. Hype. He also presents Reality Check, a daily show that aims at debunking official myths and government propaganda. Presented to you by the Aga Khan Foundation, please join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to our guests this afternoon, Abhijit V. Banerjee and Srinivasan Jain. We can do a little better than that. Come on, he's a Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, welcome everyone uh, to what we hope promises to be a very engaging session. It's wonderful to see such a huge turnout, completely packed to the rafters as expected. Uh, and so it's, an, it's a real pleasure and privilege to have Abhijit here uh, with us. So welcome, Abhijit, to... Thank you for the festival for having me. Yeah. I'm um, really excited. <laughs> it's an amazing event. Right. So one of the challenges that I was, I was talking to Abhijit about before we actually started this conversation is the fact that since the Nobel, and perhaps even before that, but since the Nobel, he's been on this whirlwind tour across the country and he's been having many, many conversations like this. So we were trying to think of how we contour it to make it somewhat different from some of the things uh, that he's said before. But let me just start off by asking you about the Nobel and whether life has completely turned upside down after that. Well, the number of selfies has gone up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that as we were coming in. Uh, I mean, beyond that, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm trying very hard to uh, re-establish normality. Whether I succeed or not, we'll see. It's, you know, the first months are loony, but hopefully people will forget what I look like. Right. <laughs> and the ceremony itself is pretty intense, right? I was reading about it. It's, it's almost like a marathon. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, in some ways it's a wonderful, it's like a, extended party, uh, but it's an extended party with, for example, many four-hour dinners, and four-hour dinners where you are not allowed to get up unless and until the king gets up. So, right. so if you need to go to the toilet, oh, that's <laughs> tough luck. <you> know? right. <laughs> unless the king wants to go yes. as well. <laughs> you, can follow, you can follow him. <laughs> okay. Now, okay, so let's, let's, come down now to, to, the, you know, to the work for which you were recognized. And uh, this is, of course, a branch of economics, uh, which is the randomized control trial, and which, as the Nobel citation said, that in just two decades, the work that Abhijit Banerjee, as well as Esther Duflo and Michael Kramer, who've all won it together with him, the new, new experiment-based approach has transformed development economics, which is now a flourishing field of research. So just to sort of set the ball rolling, if you could give us a sense of how this type of economics, the randomized control trials that you do, was a break from the conventional model of development economics as, as you understood it. Well, I think the conventional mo model of development economics is like much of it. Other economics is not, not particularly different. It, it starts with the idea that, you know, the way you capture the world is a model. And, and uh, that's usually justified in methodological terms. We need to have discipline on what we're doing. But in fact, it's a very ideologically loaded construction. You get 
you know, whatever you think are kind of the prem your premises of the world, you bury them inside the model, and then it look what comes out is what you started from. So you always often end up with uh, kind of conclusions which are a little bit loaded in a particular direction. And one thing that randomized control trials do is they say, look, you know, if I want to know the answer to a question, I can right. just go and test it directly. I don't need to know what the model is. I can, if I think that, uh, for example, uh, to take a claim that's, I think, quite pernicious, is this idea that if you poor, give poor, poor people money, yes. they're going to become lazy. Right. Uh, sort of this Victorian idea. This actually turns out, you know, you can, if you look at the way economists have thought about it, it's almost built into the assumptions they make. So it comes out of the assumptions they make and they assume that therefore it's true. Uh, if you look at the data from randomized controlled trials, you see that it's actually not true. There's a bunch of um, uh, basically uh, what are called um, conditional, unconditional cash transfers, which is basically you give you people some money yes. for no, without any obligation, and you look at whether they stop working, and there's absolutely no evidence that they stop working, that the hours of work go down, anything like that. I, I, but yet, this is kind of the, one of the cornerstones of this view that, you know, you should be you know, temp temper your right. generosity because if you you be too generous to the poor, they're going to become lazy and just hurt themselves. Right. So, in a sense, it kind of liberates you from the dogmas of conventional economic thinking that anything that you do, any intervention you make, is tested on the basis of a, a field experiment. And and this, I believe, borrows from the medical sphere where you conduct experiments exactly. and exactly. then you intervene. Yeah. Right? And, and so this is now, Abhijit, something which is a full-time project for you and your team because uh, you've set up something called JPAL, which is, stands for the Jamil Poverty Action Laboratory Lab. Lab. <laughs> at, at MIT. Uh, and you are working now in how many countries? With this. Oh, I think that me is a little bit of a, a hyper, you, hyperbole. It's an organization. I, I meant the group. Yes. There are the couple of hundred professors involved in it. If you take the whole envelope of that, we're working in 80 countries. Um, wow. I can't name all of them, but yeah, 80 odd countries. Oh, that's wonderful. And quite a lot of it is here in India as well. Yeah, India is our biggest country. We have 200 people working, just staff people in India and, you know, it's, the, it's by far the country where we've done the most work and, I mean, that's one of the, one of the, uh, it's great for me because in some ways it allows me to engage back with India in a, in a very uh, specific and concrete way. Okay. So, I think one of the most interesting things about reading your book and also learning about your work is that at a time when there's such pessimism about the fact that we are struggling to change or to improve on so many different parameters, you actually have, and again when I say you, I don't mean you personally, but the work that you do, gives us examples of how it's actually possible to fix some of the great challenges of our time just through often small interventions. And I want you to kind of take us through, if I may put it, your greatest hits, ah. right? Uh, when it comes to whether it's health or education or nutrition and, and to tell us what worked and what didn't. So if you want to perhaps start off with uh, maybe learning outcomes, education, or, or, or wh whatever you'd like let's to start, start with health care. Let's, okay, let's start a, with health. It's a good one because it has the advantage of highlighting um, a particular dogma. Okay. So for many, many years, uh, it was known that, uh, and I should say, this is importantly not my work, it's work by Pascaline Dupa and Jessica Cohen, who were one of, Jessica was one of my students, and they are part of our network, and I'm taking credit for all of them. This Nobel Prize, in a sense, I feel like we got lucky. Lots of other people did the work, but nonetheless, well, I'll, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> so what they did was, uh, so this is view that, in a sense, uh, was known for many years that if you, have children sleep under uh, insecticide treated bed nets, then they don't die of malaria. And malaria is one of the largest killers of young children in Africa. Also some in India, but much less so because we don't have as much falciparum malaria. So 
and this was been known for, let's say, 20 years, but the reason why people were not using the bed nets was that they were expensive. Um, now, there was a view that we, we should subsidize them, but then there's a lot of resistance to that, and that was a good example of kind of economic ideology, because it was a, why do, why do you resist something like this? I mean, these bed nets would save lives, sure. but, you know, there's always this view, and you have these anecdotes which are extremely powerful of, you know, so you give away something, people use it for something else. So you give away bed nets, they use it for catching fish or something. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's literally, uh, you know, there's the, I think the most powerful anecdote probably happened once, which is when you give away um, condoms, children use them as balloons. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that anecdote has been repeated thousand times with right. extreme, uh, I think, uh, conviction. But it, it actually, there's no evidence for it, no rigorous evidence for it. So what these people did, Pascaline and Jessica did, was actually tested it. So they did two things. One is they varied the price at which you could get the bed net. Okay. And you can see basically at zero price, everybody wants a bed net. But as soon as you raise the price to even 10% of the market price, it falls off quite fast. Well, that's, that could be because, for example, if it's free, people just take it to catch fish. Now, this next thing they did, and it's, this is what makes the kind of randomized control trial world a bit different, is they decided, fine, we can actually find out. We can go to people's houses and check if the children are sleeping under bed nets. Right. So they did that, and you find no correlation between the price that you buy and whether you use the bed net or not. The correlation was exactly zero. So in other words, people use it just as much when you give them free than when you don't. When this came out, there was lot, lots of cribbing, but eventually I think the, uh, the ideological move happened. So even the people who were arguing very strongly for pricing uh, these things decided, fine, it's not worth it. What's happened as a result in, this, in the last 10 years, the malaria deaths have been halved. Five million children are not dying every year. As a wow, result. that's amazing. Is this, now are we talking world over? Are we talking a particular country where this was World, done? Worldwide. Fine. Worldwide. But that's, a, that's what, I think that's still, uh, that, the number is mostly from Africa, but it's because that's where all the deaths were. But so that's a, a huge, that was a huge learning based yes. on, on that experiment. Exactly. That? So that's a very powerful experiment. It sort of changes in the end our perspective on something which then spreads across everything because the same view, you shouldn't right. give it to people free because they're going to abuse it, uh, kind of pervades our, our way we think about lots of policies. Okay, let's, let's perhaps move to education and learning outcomes because again, like health with all these other areas, the common belief is that if you just spend more, if governments increase public spending on these areas, things will start to improve. But it again boils down to exactly what you spend it on. Correct. And, and in particular, so, what you spend it on is, uh, it's almost free if you do it right. That's, that's the, what's sad about the education story and it took us, you know, 15 years of work, mostly with Pratham. Um, I know Pratham Books is here, so, yeah. but, and that was 15 years of work with Pratham to piece it together, exactly what was going wrong, why weren't children in schools not learning, mm. and I think the answer is so embarrassingly simple that's, you know, in retrospect it feels like, you know, we were idiots or what, but it, it, the answer is uh, everybody in the education system, and I mean, I don't mean uh, just teachers, I mean administrators, parents, children, hmm. everybody believes that the syllabus is some hallowed object. You know, you have to, so in our right to education law, yes. it says every year you have to cover the syllabus. Now, that's, that sounds r sensible, except that the syllabus is not written for the kids who are necessarily, you know, first generation literate. So what happens is a lot of these children, by the time they're in uh, second grade, they've fallen behind, they can't read. Uh, now, but in fourth grade, they have to study social studies, and social studies is, involves reading, but you know, you can't read, so what do you do? You go to class and it's, it's like playing a movie in a language you don't know with right. no subtitles. And so you, you listen to this whole thing every day, you eventually get tired and give up, uh, but 
in a sense, the solution is very straightforward. This is what Pratham has been saying for a long time, but I think in some ways, the exactness of it, I think, has emerged only over time, which mm. is that basically you take children for a couple of hours a day, teach them what they need to learn and not the syllabus. Uh, so okay. if, if, a for child example? Cannot, if a child cannot read, right. uh, you teach them how to read. If they can't do add, don't teach them calculus. Uh, teach them how to add. If you do okay. that, they catch up very fast. It's not that children ha lack talent. They just lack, there's this sense in which there's an order in education. Hmm. And if you follow that order, you get to it. And that, that view just happens to be false. So. So, so tell me a little bit more specifically about this experiment. This was conducted in any particular these part are, of India or? Ten, ten, 10 or 12 experiments conducted. I mean, the first one was in Maharashtra and Gujarat. Hmm. There were experiments in Bihar, UP, um, Uttarakhand, all, all over in, uh, India, okay. Haryana. So there was a series of experiments, each of which kind of refining this, this hypothesis, which is what we now call teaching at the right level, which is exactly what I said, which is just teach children what they need to learn and not… As opposed to just follow this rigid syllabus. Yes, yes. And did it actually start to show results in terms of improving yes. learning I mean, outcomes? You, you do it in, in, in UP, we see, uh, we, uh, there's an experiment we did in 2015-16 and we see that uh, the children go from basically not being able to read to being able to read relatively fluently. Half the children do that if you do 50 days of couple of hours of teaching mm -hmm. focused on what they don't know gets both their math and their uh, reading scores up dramatically. Wow. Like, so, so there was a significant change after uh, the very, intervention. Very large, not just significant, very large change in it. And it, it wasn't, there was no resources involved. It was just reorganizing, in a sense, the use of the time. But the time was uh, being used in ways that were not very fruitful. Okay. Let me ask you uh, for one final example before we move on to some slightly broader questions, which is kind of linked to what you said at the outset about this myth that if you give people money, they will waste it, especially the poor, that you give money that they'll waste it. And you've studied microfinance, right, which has been the kind of flavor of, I don't know, not even the month or the decade, it's been around for the longest time, as one of the ways in which you can bring people out of poverty is by giving them small loans. Your work has actually challenged that dogma. Yeah. I mean, I think now I don't think there is that dogma. I think the dogma was kind of a series of randomized control trials that we and others did kind of destroyed it. I think, I think we've what very robustly people find, yes. and we found it in several studies and others, is that for 95% of the population, it doesn't involve any change in the income. What basically what happens is people take the loan, they buy something with it, they pay for the daughter's wedding, they do something, and they maybe start a small business to pay for the loan. To just repay the loan. Repay the loan, but it, they have no intention of growing the business. So the business never has an employee, it never has real you know, uh, assets, it just sort of subsists till the loan is paid back, then they shut it down. So right. it's, uh, you see, uh, and you know, and, and we've seen this now in, I think in seven or eight countries where we've done these randomized control trials, we see systematically the same thing. We did two, two in India, both have the same results. So it's very predictably, there is nothing, no gains in earnings, except maybe for the 5% hmm. who happen to be really motivated. Okay, so if you're really well entrepreneurial, motivated, really motivated, then you can manage to actually make a significant change in your income. Yeah, so those so, people do. So what works then? What's a better option to a small loan, to lift people think, out of poverty? I think something much more exciting is happening <laughs> over there. I, uh, I can tell you who that is. That's my colleague Ravish, I who's see. conducting a session there. But, I, it's, but, I, but you've drawn, uh, you know, a, 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 crowd, a pretty different crowd, but maybe, um, well, this is maybe a, this they're is wasting their time and something else well. should, have been, they should have been elsewhere. Um, so. What does work, uh, and I mean, this is no, maybe uh, 
it would not be a surprise except for the fact that there is so much prejudice about the abilities of the poor. So we, we have now done this in many countries, same experiment, hmm. uh, which is to give the very poor an asset. Okay, so give, not lend, give them an asset, but give them an asset that's you know, nothing particularly fancy, not, uh, you know, not a factory, uh, maybe a cow or uh, maybe a few goats or some trinkets to sell. And okay. then uh, you look at what happens to these people. We have been following these people for 10 years now. Okay. And 10 years later, they are 25% richer, they are healthier, they're happier, the children are more educated. In other words, it's not that when you give them a, a kind of a freebie, they uh, become lazy and, you know, give up and just fall back into poverty. In fact, right. they go, this kind of encourages them to keep trying and they, they, they really are much more, they work harder actually. Mm. They work many more hours than the people who didn't get the assets. So they really are, it's more a matter, so it's not at all that when you give these extremely poor people some freebies, they become lazy. If anything, they are encouraged, they feel that life isn't, doesn't suck as much and they actually try to do okay. something about their lives. And, and what you said was interesting, that this is actually an idea that has legs, that you've tracked this for 10 years, because one of the questions that arises with these sorts of interventions is, is it sustainable over yeah, a period so, of time? It's sustainable. So, we, we calculate the rate of return on the investment. In India, it's 400%. Okay. 400 so, you, you know, the net income that it generates is, you know, four times the amount you put in. Okay. Um, it's, uh, and the same experiment was done in Bangladesh and also been followed for 10 years and it's a, I exactly the same. So, so it's see. as simple as a cow or a couple of goats well, uh, to actually, as, as examples should, of assets. I should which, clarify. And some encouragement. It's important that it, there is some encouragement at the beginning because many right. of these people, they've actually never done anything in their lives. They were, you, all, in India, we were only had women, only had women who typically were either their husbands had, they got married at 16, they were their husbands abandoned them or their husbands became an alcoholic or their husbands became mm -hmm. sick. So they were, and, now you are at 25, you have two children, right. and you're a deer in a headlight because you have no idea, you were never brought up to have any sense of how to actually make a living. Sure. Uh, you were married at 16, you were or 14, and you were supposed to be a wife, housewife, and your right. husband was supposed to... Gen so these people are, look, they, they were, most of them were begging, basically. Okay. And now you take these people and you give them uh, the asset and you look at them uh, 10 years later and they're like, do, you know, doing all kinds of things. Uh, you know, they're running businesses. With this this one woman who, I mean, I, I some suspicious of anecdotes, but she's such an amazing character. I should tell you about mm. uh, about her. Mm. She said, um, you know, for a while, um, you know, I, I, I li we lived in in the forest because we had. You know, they they kicked us out of my husband's village, and then I, with my children, we lived in the forest. There were tigers in the forest, so we had, you know, a couple of times we we, we would have to tie ourselves into the tree to sleep uh, because there were tigers in the forest, and the mm -hmm. tigers take children away. Right. And from there, she said, "Now I bought, uh, I built a house for my son." Uh, and now I'm going to build another house because I'm wow. going to, I actually think I'm imposing on them. I want to live alone. Amazing. So, so as you said, it's just about giving the asset and a little bit of encouragement. And, and some encouragement. Right. And also persuading them not to eat the goats as, as, well, part, I, of the, I, yeah. as part of the idea of I think the encouragement is partly that, which is, <laughs> you know, you know this guy will be back in a week and ask you where, what, <laughs> what happened, happened to, to the goats. goats. <laughs> <laughs> One's gone missing. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me flip this around and ask you your experience on another perspective on this, which is that, as we know, that India, and I'm sure this is true the world over, is not one country, it's many countries within one. And when we talk of these great challenges of poverty and equality, there can be dramatic variations within a country, within states and even within states that are regions. So from your experience of conducting your experiments, because you're working with governments all the time, what is working? Why do you think some parts of the country, some, some governments, some forms of governance work and others don't? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I, it seems to me that 
what what's striking in fact i would say is kind of the opposite which is okay. that you know you hear about you know this state is really uh, great and that state is not so good but in fact uh, in terms of effective partnerships we've had very good partnerships with you know states as different as bihar gujarat mm -hmm. tamil nadu <coughs> haryana uh, up we've worked with almost all the west bengal we work orissa we all work with almost all the you big, were mentioning big rajasthan as Rajas well where you do Ra rajasthan work where we, we are right now with lots of we've done lots of work in rajasthan and it's not so much the it's not so much the uh, you know the broad structure you know they uh, it's not so much that there are bad governments and good governments it's okay. more that there are <coughs> targets of opportunity within a government <coughs> and sometimes that can do a, it could lead to amazing things we worked with the rajasthan police department uh, you know that's sort of a uh, you know <laughs> if you think about the kind of thing people make fun of it's it's is things like police department but yes. in fact it was great working with them they were um, they understood exactly what we were trying to do they they implemented the interventions pretty well and in fact uh, you we find but, that the police yeah. actually at the end of these this is a combination of <coughs> soft skills training and giving them a little bit of a time off the police in india are still governed by the 1861 police act <coughs> unlike for example in pakistan well, what that means is 1861 remember uh, you were listening to willie Dal dalrymple here those of you was just after 1857 the mutiny <coughs> so the indian police force was constituted as a standing army of the state against its own population and it's still that it's fundamentally organized as a standing army and what that means in particular is that it's a, it doesn't have you pol police don't have days off you you yes. every 24 hours 7 days you're supposed to work of course nobody does that they sleep sometimes on the charpoys in the police station but nonetheless it's just an attitude towards being so therefore it creates an attitude of being hostile to the population right so and I, the reason why we did this study was that they had realized this and they wanted to see what they could do to improve their rating with the population and a few small interventions that they implemented actually did improve their rating we could see that we did kind of for uh, instance what was the intervention to give so them the, some time off to, to give them some time off and uh, give them some soft skills uh, training um, you know just say you know when you meet somebody you can you know talk to them nicely or yelling at them things like that <laughs> but he, but it really did work and i and in some ways i think that you can think of the police department as being extremely stodgy but they were extraordinarily they understood exactly what we were up to they were very sympathetic from the top down we worked with nina singh who who then work, was in a uh, senior person in the rajasthan police and is now back here um, right. she worked with us and it was it was wonderful uh, the whole okay. experience so I, I i think one i think we are too inclined to sort of put labels on governments and in some ways i think one of the most dangerous things we've done is being extremely cynical about governments i think this is a deep deeply uh, dangerous place to be right. uh, because in the end we need governments and if we are that cynical we're going yes. to do damage no no i agree with you these sort of sweeping generalizations that all governments are bad all politics is evil yes. doesn't help us but I was kind of asking you that question about what works and what doesn't in terms of governance uh, to frame a broader question about whether you've done any kind of trials on whether authoritarianism works. No. And the reason... <laughs> uh, I randomized dictator, I don't know. Right, you, know <laughs> you, you studied two countries, one which is authoritarian and one, <laughs> one which isn't. No, but I, I'm asking you this in a broader context because there is a view increasingly around the world of the idea that you need this kind of one strong leader who can deliver on promises, who can actually transform people's lives and you know, lift them out of their lot. Has that ever featured in terms of the work that you do, in terms of your experiment of whether 
as you less try, or more ima- authority ima- makes any ima- difference. Imagine I don't control who gets to be dictator, so it's hard to do an experiment <laughs> where you uh, well, not uh, who uh, gets uh, to be a dictator, uh, but in terms of what works better. Uh, so I think there's lots of other people, not me, who study this, um, and I think f- to a first approximation, actually, interestingly, there's no correlation between authoritarianism and uh, economic success. If anything, the correlation is negative, right. but it's, uh, it le- requires, there's like lots of people, this is a literature where there are lots of scholars, because obviously it's a big question. Unfortunately, it's one of these big questions which doesn't admit an easy answer. So you can, you can say what you want, and you know, if I believe in authoritarianism, I can defend it as much as uh, sure. the other guy. So I, I think these are fundamentally unresolvable questions. Uh, you can g- always say, oh, Singapore had a, had a uh, you know, successful dictator. Yes. Uh, and then you can come back with saying, and think about Zimbabwe. Uh, sure. it, it, we could have this conversation ad nauseum. I, right. I don't think we're going to, it, it's supposed to be resolvable. I think what is important, however, is that even if you think of Singapore, a tiny place with an enormously powerful government, yes. one thing they were very conscious of is decentralizing all the time. Right. So to the neighborhood groups, to the neighbor, I mean, not often not democratically elected groups, but still power was quickly devolved. And sure. I think it's very important in a country, the India size, to not have the illusion that anybody, however competent, can really change a lot because you know well, the implementation in the end is, uh, you know, uh, six hundred thousand villages, and that's wh- wh- who's going to implement. Or you can say all the good things, you can threaten as many people, but you know how many people are going to shoot? So <laughs> I, I really think that at some level, uh, authority is an illusion mostly. Okay, no, that's an interesting point about Singapore. I don't think people realize that that you have this seemingly. Almost a quarantine uh, and set up, but actually at the ground level, there, is a, there take, is a lot of devolution. Take, take China. China is, a, is, in many ways, China has on the ground democracy, even though it's such an authoritarian setup. But, you know, a village, they, have, they introduced, I think, 20 years ago, right. uh, village elections. And they're elected leaders, and you can see, compare places which have elections which we don't, and the elections were phased in, so some places had elections early. And the elected leaders behave differently from the appointed leaders, and so they have actually uh, right. devolved power. China, in many ways, is more decentralized than in, uh, much more decentralized than India, right. uh, even though it's such a centralizing uh, force, the Communist Party. In the end, party, party competi- intra-party competition inside every province is extremely important, and if you, are, if you make your province w- work well, you get promoted to be the party secretary, and then you get to go to Beijing, and it's really right. a very much more of a, a kind of a federal system than, in a sense, India is. Okay. Autocratic democracies, or democratic autocracies. We're also learning yeah. about these terms uh, here yeah, as we go along. Yeah. But uh, last question to you before I think uh, we'll sort of move towards opening it up for questions, is that, and we were talking about this just before, uh, uh, you know, about planning our conversation, that you're also talking about something which I think we think about quite a lot in India, which is about political choices and about whether many of these things you talked about, the fact that governments can actually deliver change to the lives of people is influencing voter choices or not, and whether your work has... So we've done lots sort of address of, that. Yeah, we've done lots of work on that class of questions. I'll tell, I'll tell you two experiments we did, which are I think very telling. One, one is an experiment we did in in UP um, some years ago, um, and the, the intervention was extremely mundane. It was just saying, you know, vote on development issues, don't vote on caste. Okay, that that was the message. It was delivered through a set of uh, puppet shows. Um, and we randomized across 200 villages. Some villages got puppet shows and some didn't. And po- a, a nice poster and uh, and some songs. But right. it was really not. Uh, it was not. We, we didn't tell them what to vote on. We didn't tell them, you know. Who to vote for? Absolutely not, because of course, then you get into lots of trouble. Sure. Um, we, 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 but all, all that we were saying is, you know, vote well. 
vote on development issues, issues and not which, on caste. Right. You see 10 percentage point movement in the set of people who vote for their own caste party. 10 percentage point movement in which direction? Well, in, uh, away from, so people, 10 percent, people are 10 percentage points less likely to vote for the, you know, their own caste party, which in U UP, you know what the designations are. So oh, I see. Okay. So you can actually get people to move away from voting through these silos of identity. Correct. Towards more bread and butter issues by giving them that little yes, input, that little literacy. Not the info. It was no information given. It was just getting people to think, okay, look, maybe it's actually worth trying. So in some ways, I think what it's saying, and I think other evidence suggests the same thing. Right. People have very little information about the candidates. Right. And therefore, uh, you know, they all twiddle them and twiddle D. I I might as vote for the guy who has the same name as me, since I know nothing about them and I have no faith that they're going to be any different. And right. I think what plays into this is our cynicism of the political system. Because we think, uh, you know, sab sala chor hai, then of <laughs> course uh, that's self-confirming in a sense because you treat yeah. everybody as a chor. Right. Whereas in fact, we, if you look at the data, it's not the case that everybody is equally corrupt. There's lots of people who are you know, uh, who get very rich as soon as they join politics sure. and other people who don't and we can track them through, you know, there's data to track them. So it's not the case that everybody is e equally bad. Sure. But once you start with the premise that everybody is equally bad, then it's very easy to fall into this trap of saying, look, then I might as well vote for the guy who has my name. But then, of course, it becomes essentially, there's no reason for me to, tr as a politician, there's no reason for me to try because, yeah. you know, I, if I have the wrong name, I'm going to lose. Yes. So, I, I there's no incentive. It's a, a self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, you know, yeah. issue. I think we should be very scared of being too cynical about the political system. No, no, absolutely. But, but did you lose your contracts in UP after that experiment? You finally <laughs> found that uh, the political parties were like, this is a great experiment, but let's do it somewhere else. <laughs> yes. It, it, it was not good for business. It was not, it was not maybe uh, <laughs> particularly popular as a conclusion, but, but right. I think it's important that we emphasize that there sure. is a sense in which I think we should not ascribe too much weight to the uh, choices people make because okay. if you assign them then you sort of become cynical about the whole thing. Right. Uh, one final question before we open it up. So the, the sort of commonly held criticism of, of your method of interventions and I'm sure you've heard this n number of times is that At least. This, is, this is very, these are all small bite-sized interventions. You can't really scale them up. They don't address bigger macroeconomic challenges to do with the political economy. And so, therefore, it's wrong to give too much importance to, to RCTs. And, and so, in a sense, when you got the Nobel, it, and you must have seen this, it upset quite a few people, <laughs> including some other Nobel laureates as well. Yeah. Uh, and to I, that, you would say what? I, I guess I feel like, you know, I, I think uh, I go back to what I said about uh, authoritarianism. There are lots of big questions. I'm not sure there are lots of big questions that can be answered. So I think there's an illusion that because we have a, we can ask the question, we can give it an answer. I feel like one, one thing that I think we need to be, as a social science, we need to be more modest about, is what are things we can give reliable answers to. We can bullshit about many things, uh, and we do. But I am not sure that, so part of my response is sure, but you know, uh, which of those big questions have you convincingly answered? Let me give the one that example that I think uh, people often have in mind, which is, you know, uh, is a market economy a good thing or a bad thing? Is it? Now, yeah. in a sense, the problem with that question is, what is a market economy? Uh, you know, if you asked in 1989, I'll give you the example that we cite in our book. Um, in 1989, the Wall Street Journal, wise arbiter of market economies, mm -hmm. um, published a, there was a hundred anniversary, so they, they were being expensive. So they said, okay, we're going to predict what's going to happen in the future. And they predicted which, is, which country will be a great success in the future, and I'll, I'll spare you the whole list, but Zimbabwe was one of the countries they predicted. Which country will fail? And it was China. China is going to fail because in the end it's a communist country and the state has too much authority. China has actually increased its share of state ownership of capital since then. Right. Uh, it's, it's China is the country where the banking sector is almost entirely controlled by the state. If you asked in 1989, would you predict 
that China is going to be the great success of the next 30 years, yes. nobody would have said yes. All of us, uh, us economists would have said, no, no way, they, they need to privatize. In fact, they, they patted our face and did what they wanted and succeeded. So I, I think at this point, I think the I think what we should take away from that example is just humility. I think, you know, we, we know, don't know a damn thing about how within those limits of, you know, let's not do what Venezuela did or what North Korea does or what India used to do before 1991. Yeah. But I mean, once you go beyond the uh, limits of the absurd, yeah. which is, uh, I think, India in 1991, I don't think there is very much that we actually know. So all right. these big questions, fine. But, you know, tell me a reliable answer and I will take it more seriously. Okay. <laughs> That's why you called it a, the wise arbiter of uh, market economy is Wall Street Journal. I like that little twist. Okay, um, let's uh, go across to questions because I'm sure there'll be lots of them. I'll only request you to keep your question brief and no statements, please. Let's just limit it to questions. So, uh, lady over there in the glasses. Yes, over there. Um, Abhijit, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I have two quick questions. The first is, given that your experiments are often run in villages, a number of villages, how do you ensure the external validity of those experiments? How do you ensure they apply to states across India? How do you ensure they apply to other countries? Um, and my second question is, there's so many problems in the world that need to be solved. How do you um, and Esther and Michael go about choosing what to try and answer? Uh, so, the excellent question. The first one, let me say that, I, I mean, you learn, do exactly what you think you sh uh, we one would do, which is run multiple experiments. You don't draw a conclusion from one, you run 10 of them, and we've run, on some issues, we've run more than 10. Uh, you do the same thing over and over, you just kind of get tedious, but at least you get confirmation. I, and I, I think that's how we learn most things. It's not that we learn, you know, uh, you know, where as a child, you you know, you go near a fire, it looks hot, and then you don't do it. It's, it we learn by experimenting. It's, that's, that's the norm. Um, the to second question, I mean, to be honest, you know, life takes over a lot, meaning I happen to have friends in Rajasthan, so I worked a lot in Rajasthan. I, uh, I'm not sure that it has deep uh, roots in exactly where I would work. Other, uh, you know, I didn't spend a lot of hours thinking about it. I, I had friends in Udaipur, uh, so we, I've done lots of work in Udaipur because it was I had good friends there, and that's. Um, I think that's Michael worked in uh, Kenya because Michael was uh, as uh, just after being an undergraduate, he won spent a year teaching in Kenya. And that's the reason why he has roots in Kenya. I, I think it's, it's normal. That's why, in a sense, I'm, we are lucky to have 200 people in JPAL because they have roots in different places. Right. So it's randomized in that sense. That's the choice right. of where <laughs> the and scholar. how you intervene. Lady over here, yes. Uh, hello, sir. First of all, congratulations. Thank you. Oh, sorry. And you make us proud, and we had a wonderful uh, discussion over here. I just wanted to ask you, uh, you uh, know very well that the Indian economy is ailing on many... Yeah, it so was I a dangerous thing to say. Oh. <laughs> 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 Note how we stayed away from that for 45 minutes, but anyway, here we go. So yes. I just wanted to know whether you have a quick fix formula for that. And the other thing is that we, since you have worked uh, a lot uh, in different parts of uh, India and on ground level, if you are in future offered the post of governor of, of RBI, will you be willing to take that? Okay. <laughs> so uh, let me start with the second question. <laughs> Absolutely not. I'm one thing. Uh, I think to be a governor of RBI, you better be a macroeconomist. I've spent my life trying to avoid being a macroeconomist. So I'm going to. Uh, on the first question, uh, I think I don't think there's any ever any quick fixes. To be honest, I think we have uh, we are in a deep. Uh, cycle and I think lots of things will take time to fix. I think the banking sector in particular is not, it's, it's sort of 
going to be a slow process of rebuilding assets. I just, we don't think, we don't have the money to really fix it. So we're kind of, what China did, which was to basically put money into the banking sector to kind of write off the loans, we can't really afford. So we're, now having said that, I think we should, so, but I'll say one thing, which is I think we shouldn't obsess too much with our deficit. I think this is a point to kind of, uh, you know, a bit um, liberate ourselves from the obsession with the deficit, especially since, to be honest, as many people have pointed out, we actually don't meet our deficit targets. Our deficits are far yeah. higher than what we claim them to be, so we might as well embrace that. Um, okay, so you're saying just spend, spend, spend liberally, right, right don't now worry spend, about, spend. you know, the, mon your, your the monetary deficit. policy committee, all these things, I feel like this is, this is like a lot of, lot of shackles we've put ourselves on. Right now, we don't need them. Right. Okay, uh, let's try and get questions from the back. Uh, gentleman over there. At the back, at the back. With a, he's waving some kind of a torch. Yeah. <laughs> okay, not him, but does, well, yes. Yeah. Uh, congratulations on your achievement, sir. Thank you. Uh, you worked with the Congress party for a lot of time. So, do you think that India needs a better opposition than it has right now? Uh, I, it's irrespective of whether I work with the Congress party, I think India needs a better opposition. Opposition is the heart of democracy. E, 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 even, the, even the ruling party should want a better opposition, right. just to keep it in check. <laughs> now we are competing with the guys next door. <laughs> okay, uh, lady in the glasses over there. Yes, you, yeah. Not really. <laughs> Hello. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I would like to ask that in your experiments, what is the root cause you found, uh, you find that helps in alleviating those problems? Like what is the basic problem you face while conducting those experiments and how do you come up with any sort of conclusion or solution for those? Look, I, I think it's exactly, in many ways, I think the general message from our work is that there is no silver bullet, there are many silver pellets. You, there are many, many problems. Poverty, like, in a sense, cancer, is many problems. It's many different diseases. And, uh, you know, some people are education poor, some people are health poor, some people are asset poor. And you have to figure out what, what's missing. And in some ways, I think trying to solve everything with one, uh, one uh, action is unlikely to work and never does work. Okay, uh, let's take questions from this side. Uh, yes, can we have a mic to this lady here in the pink? Yeah. Um, would you say that the results of your work, at least to some extent, make branches of conventional economics a bit irrelevant? Like the, the study of conventional economics? Uh, so, I would say no. Uh, not at all. Um, I mean, otherwise, uh, you know, I, I, was I get fired. Yes, <laughs> I was about to say, <laughs> so let's pick I, a fight. I, I, have a, I have a job in an economics department, I, which <laughs> I value. I, um, and I, I, but the honest truth is no. I, but I think it means that we should think about it differently. I think we shouldn't, I think the, I think the usual mapping is as soon as you word, mention the word economics, people start thinking about deficit, deficit, interest rates, uh, exchange rates. I think economics is much more interesting than that. It's much more, uh, you know, I think the, it's a way of thinking about the world and it's a, it's a very valuable way of thinking of the world in a sense, asking a lot of questions that um, sort of we don't often ask, which is what is the motivation, why people are doing these things, what's the, what's the why, why aren't they succeeding in doing what they want to do. So I think it's a, it's a good starting point, it's a good discipline, and we learn a lot from doing those exercises. I think, if, I think maybe less, less obsession with interest rates and the stock market. Right. Let's try and go uh, like far back. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're just, a, I can't even ident isolate, there's so many hands up, but if you can just get like anyone at the back, the gentleman there with the beard. Yes. I, I will mention three things. First, food for work program. Second, midday meal. Third, 
the disastrous ban, complete ban on cow slaughter. What is your opinion about these three things? Uh, I, I, you know, I think that you already gave your opinion. <laughs> it was actually a trick question. <laughs> he doesn't really want to know your view. <laughs> he just wanted to express this. <laughs> I, I can't, I don't, I missed the uh, first one. Uh, I, I mean, I, I guess the note ban? Was it D? I can't. I, 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 no, it anyway, was, sorry. It was, the first one was um, mm, mm, food for work. So food for work, in a sense, is a good, one, good example to bring up because it was a program that NREGA was modeled on, but it's actually very different. Because what, the way it was implemented was that when there was a, a food shortage or uh, kind of income shortage at the, at the district level, the district magistrate could uh, basically uh, access some funds to implement open camps in response. Right. NREG has become so bureaucratic that you, know, you can't respond to anything. We, we looked at how much of the fall in income the, from, uh, let's say, uh, a drought is covered by NREG, it's, it's the order of 2%. It really doesn't respond. It's not responsive because the whole structure is one in which six months ahead you have to propose your projects. Right. And so that, uh, by the time you get, in, now the drought comes and now you don't have any way of proposing projects. So it's, it's a much less flexible than it should be. Okay, uh, lady in the front here. Is this work? Okay. Thank you so much for being here and for your talk and congratulations on the prize. Thank you. Wondering what, uh, Indian women's participation in the workforce is dropping. And I'm wondering what you've observed in your experiments and what kinds of interventions you think might work to reverse that trend. You know, to be honest, I don't know uh, of any experiment that actually directly addresses that. Um, it's, um, I, it's unfortunate because I think you're exactly right. It's a frightening fact. Um, I think that what we do know a little bit is, and people seem to be looking into it, and uh, is that the, what, the, if you look at the income profile, it seems to be correlated with uh, growth. So it seems to be that partly people who are getting a little richer are actually imposing on, on their wives or encouraging their wives or the wives are happy to participate. I don't know what, which way it works, but it's, I'm guessing that there's a little bit of all of those things to not go out and work. So I, th I think it's partly a symptom of, uh, of growth and our attitude towards women, I think. And uh, unfortunately, uh, now, uh, I, uh, let me, just to, so that I don't entirely punt on that question, one, one uh, nice experiment was done in East UP uh, by one of my students. What she did was she w worked with uh, uh, an NGO in Bombay to design a program where women were encouraged to believe that they can. So it was a self-efficacy intervention. And you find that both their self-efficacy goes up and they start working. So, this, uh, yeah, so I think partly they are also f encouraged to think of themselves as powerless. And I think when you actually intervene, it, it does help. So I think part of the problem is uh, sort of a learned helplessness that I think we, we are culturally sustaining. Um, Okay, uh, I'll come back to the front. Let me just uh, go again to the back. Yes, gentlemen over there. Uh, yeah, yes. It's poor economics in his hand. Uh, first of all, congratulations sir, for your achievement. Thank you. So my question to you is very uh, simple, that uh, as we all know, lack of education and quality of education is one of the main reasons in poverty in rural areas. So according to you, is it the reservation in the recruitment of teachers in rural areas is justified and the reservation in economy as, economy as a whole? I have no idea. I don't think any, there's any particularly good uh, study of it. And uh, it seems to me that um, there's clearly uh, lots of reasons to have reservations. There could be reasons in the other direction. The, the only study I've seen suggests that uh, the people who 
get into education system f f through reservations do benefit a lot. Um, of course, you know, they, they also um, take places away from other people, but I, I don't know that there's a sense in which, uh, I don't know of a study that actually reliably answers the question you are suggesting, so I, I, I'm going to sort of pass. Okay. Pass. Yes, gentlemen here in the front. Thank you, Abhijit. Thank you so much. <laughs> you yourself mentioned about the multiple kind of poverty. But at the same time, the very discourse of poverty is extremely demeaning. And you yourself, in a way, use that discourse. My query is, are you reproducing that discourse or there is a need to rethink foundationally the language of poverty? My second quick query is, that your practice of randomized sampling, is it only empiricist in a naive sense or there are possibilities of creative dialogue between empirical work and related wider theoretical kind of formulation? So let me avoid the first question because I don't know what to say about it. I think you have a view. I, I will leave it to you to you have your... Um, I, I, is this not the forum to have a um, debate on uh, what words uh, are legitimate. On the second question, I think there is a dialogue and the dialogue is um, in a sense inevitably a part of all, all research. Whenever you do a piece of research, you, you know, you have to interpret it and you have to interpret it in terms of some story. In fact, if you look at our two books, there are attempts to build stories around these randomized control trials to, to see what, what meta-narrative can they sustain and, you know, and what do they rule out. So that's always a, a, any, any uh, you can't, if, if you only did like, a, if you only f think of a, a, a pointillist paint, painting, it's like, you know, you put in like dots of paint, uh, but, but you know, if you just look at the dots of paint, it would not be interesting. It's interesting because you can step back and look at it. And it's always a necessary part of it, what everybody does. It's not that we are particularly special in that. Right. We literally have time for just one more question. Uh, someone at the back, someone at the back, please. I can't identify any one person, so whoever grabs the mic. <laughs> Hello? Uh, uh, congratulations, sir. Thank you did you. all of us proud. I think 1.3 billion Indians, we are really, really proud of you. Thank and you. I just wanted to know what compelled you to wear ethnic Indian clothes at the ceremony. And second, oh, I, 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 finally, a serious question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's actually, uh, I mean, I, I, I guess I felt like, you know, you had no choice. Basically, they said, you have to wear white tie. White tie means you have to buy, like, all kinds of fancy stuff. There is a kamar band, all this thing. Right. You look like a penguin. I, 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 see, I saw no reason to, uh, to give in to that. And there was one loophole, which is you could wear uh, your native clothes. Now, in fact, we, we were discussing what native codes to ab adopt since uh, India is kind of a diverse set of, of uh, choices and, um, and uh, eventually we conversed to one. But it was not, it was, it was obvious to me that there was absolutely no reason, and to my wife in fact, right. both of us wore Indian clothes because the alternative was to wear something extremely stuffy and there was no yeah. particular reason to do that. I was actually a a bit worried when I saw you in that Bengali dhoti because it looked like you were in sub-zero temperatures in Sweden and so like walking around in the snow with a dhoti, I'm not sure how that… Uh, uh, yeah, but, uh, but they, they were very um, so solicitous of that. They okay. uh, drove me to the… exactly for that reason, they realized that I, my… Um, I was uh, uh, poorly defended, so they were… <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. I, I just want to end by asking you, the, you know, the, the question that he asked you that you, that you make uh, all of us in India proud, which of course you do, and it's wonderful that, that you, you and, and you. so many others before you have won it. But I also like the way that India claims these Nobels as their own. And, <laughs> and I, and I kind of want to ask you… Um, I'll just ask you in very simple terms, that do you think that you could have won this Nobel if you were 
based here in India and doing work out of India? I don't know. I don't think so. I think I benefited enormously from being, uh, I would say, being in a place where I, you know, the, I would, I had some of the world's, I would say, uh, best potential PhD students and collaborators. And I think those, that's so important. I mean, I think… At, the, at MIT, where at the MIT, MIT where has, Pal is based. His, historically had the best PhD program in economics in the world. And it, it's a most coveted PhD program. So, I, I have so many students. So, all this work that I'm taking credit for, most of it was done by others and uh, by other… Well, my, my students, my collaborators, my friends. And that, I think, is, is just the… It's the confluence of those things which makes it so valuable. And in a sense, that's, that's what I think makes it hard for... It's not that there's no talent here, but it's just... The, it's, it's the bringing together of people at a very large scale that, that right. actually changes the nature of the enterprise. There are lots of talented people, but it's very hard to do it alone. That's, I mean, that's both wonderful. It speaks so much to the, to the quality of institutions like MIT, but it's also somewhat sad that... We can't have that here, that so many of you, whether it's you, Amartya Sen, Venki Ramakrishnan, it has to really come from those institutions, um, you know, outside of these borders. But it certainly makes a case for open borders. And, and, you know, that's something which is important to underline and, at this time. And for trying to build better institutions. And for building better institutions. Okay. Abhijit Banerjee, thank you so much. It's been a thank wonderful you. conversation. You've been a great audience. A round of applause for Abhijit Banerjee. Thank you. Once again, let's show our thanks to Abhijit V. Banerjee and also to Srinivas and Jane for moderating this session. This session was brought to you by the Aga Khan Foundation. Now, I hate to be a source of disappointment. Unfortunately, Abhijit V. Banerjee has an immediate appointment, so he will not be able to sign books right now. However, there is some good news. He will be presenting the OJAS Art Award here at the Nexa Front Lawn at 4.45 p.m. That finishes at 5.15, and he will be happy to sign your books here at the Nexa Front Lawn at 5.15. So you'll be able to find him at the Z Kiosk, which is the author signing area in the far right corner here of the venue. In a few minutes, we'll be going into